Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome, listeners, to episode 64 of the Ad Nauseam Podcast. My name is Dr. Jeff Winkle. I'm here pulling a late night one with my good friend and co host, Dr. David Noe. How are you feeling over there on the other side of the table, Dave? Square root eight. Square root eight? Four. Yes. Uh, what is the square root of eight? I don't know, but the square root of 64 is eight. Yes. And that's how I'm feeling. That's how you're feeling? Yes. I don't know what that means. I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> Tight belt in the, in the middle, right? I, okay. You know, what, what did the zero say to the eight? You know this one. What, no. You're a dad. You don't like dad jokes? I, I know a few. I don't know if I know this one, though. The zero said to the eight, nice belt? Nice. Uh, okay, I get that one. Yeah, I think my boys would like that one. Boy, you, you're Man. just... Uh, you're really glum this evening, aren't you? I, I'm probably comparatively glum, but I'm, I'm hoping to pick up as we get along you here. You criticize? You find more faults than a seismologist? <laughs> I've been saving that. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I've been saving it. That's good. That's Thanks. good. Now, now, that one I will use. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Hey, we got to start with our shout out today. Uh, it goes to a one Mr. Peter Vale. Mr. Peter Vale. Yeah. Whose last name is Latin at V-A-L-E, right? Yeah, Wale. Wale. Goodbye. Goodbye, Peter. Goodbye. Friend of mine, yep. uh, student of mine. Um, I mean, I've learned from him, but we are studying some Latin together. And here we go. This guy, what an impressive resume. I th- he, this, half of this has to be made up. I don't I'm, think so. I'm not buying it. No, there's a lot of padding in most resumes, yeah. but I know Peter. He's the real deal. This is the real deal? Okay. Yeah, this is currently, he's a second year doctoral student in biblical studies at Boston College. Mm-hmm. Focusing on the Hebrew Bible. I'd like to point out that Jerome called Hebrew a broken-winded language. He did. Yes. He was born and raised in suburban Massachusetts, the second oldest of nine children. Wow. It's wow. A, it's a big family. Uh, has lived in Southwest Florida since 2005. Completed his undergraduate studies at Harvard in 2006. You read this part. Yeah, uh, uh, In the same class as one Mark Zuckerberg. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, uh, that, that would explain Peter's uh, gray hoodies that I often see him wearing. Is that right? <laughs> And Zuckerberg, wasn't he a classics major, right? Yes, he put on his application to Harvard that uh, his second language is Latin, I think. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. okay. All right, all right, yeah. So, yeah, so he says uh, he was a classmate of, of Zuckerberg, but mm-hmm. um, they were not friends. No, no, I guess not. Didn't cross Not paths. trying to read too much into that, but... Um, yeah. So Peter has spent many years discerning a call to the diocesan priesthood and uh, has mm. studied in Miami and Rome and New Orleans, been all over... This is the really interesting part. Licensed boat captain. Wow. Wow. That's a deep dive into his details, yes. right? Yeah. Master scuba diver and amateur sailor. So I, 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 how, how does one become a master scuba diver? Is it just like the hours you put in, I yeah, guess? I, don't, I imagine it has to do with hours. Yeah. Someone could tell us or, you know, we could do research, but that's not going to happen probably. <laughs> right. So wow, this guy's done it all. Yep. Right. And we're not done here. He's, uh, he's got uh, personal obsessions with Thomas Merton. And Thoreau, Mm -hmm. um, he's fluent in Spanish, Italian, and Swedish. Yeah. Yeah. It's a strange combination. Yeah, yeah. Spanish, okay. Italian, that makes sense. But But Swedish? Swedish, Right. It's out of left field. Left field, right. It's a smorgasbord of languages. (laughs) And he's proficient in Latin, Greek, Hebrew, Akkadian, and Old Norse. My goodness. So, Peter, uh, it's a a pleasure to be able to read your your shout out here. Thanks for being a... Uh, devotee of all things classics. Thanks for being a fine student of mine and for listening to the podcast. We're so appreciative. Yeah. After going through this resume, I feel like we kind of should have him on the show. Yeah. Or maybe we should just call it quits. <laughs> it's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks, Peter, for inspiring us to give up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jeff, yes. uh, what are we giving the audience this evening? Well, this is part two okay. of a two parter of how to be. Makes a... perfect sense. Yes. Of how to be a Latin guru. We're going to pick it up where we left off last time, maybe with a small recap. Uh, but kind of, we're gonna get into the into the real into the weeds today. Yeah, down into the nitty gritty. Yep. Mm-hmm. Of how to how to do this thing. All right, let's do it. And you're gonna give us the opening quote. I am. Which, like last week, is from. It is from uh, a book called Latin or the Empire of a Sign from the 16th to the 20th centuries by Francois Waquette. Am I? I think that's right. Yeah. Yep. All right. We'll have to ask Peter, although he doesn't have French <laughs> <laughs> on his resume. Yeah, yeah. Peter can't help us with this one. Oh no. Oh yeah. <laughs> So this is, uh, what, pages 99 and 100? Yes, under a heading called School Children Latin Capturing the Monster. All right. 
Until the 1960s, most children in secondary education found themselves faced with long years of Latin. Without going back to the ancien regime. Keep going. All right, when Latin and learning to read were the same subject. Remember that even in the late 19th century, a child was set at Latin at the age of seven and did not see the last of it until he left secondary school 10 or 11 years later. For those 10 years, moreover, it was the bulk of his diet in terms of the hours assigned to it and the number of translations and compositions and recitations required. Even when the old language began to lose its importance in education, it remained one of the fundamental disciplines of the curriculum. It was still usual to do six or seven years of it in the 1960s. Wow. For Catholic children, the prayers learned from the catechism and heard at Mass helped engender an early familiarity with Latin. The subject they encountered on entering secondary school was not unknown and therefore alarming, but, in Mary McCarthy's phrase, an old friend. Mm. That the Latin that used to accompany adolescents did not show itself in a particularly attractive light, however. The teaching, dominated by a hypergrammatical tendency and based on texts chosen for the linguistic and moral qualities, was generally very austere. The forbidding image that resulted was one confirmed was confirmed to some extent, we will return to this later, by the difficulty of acquiring the rudiments of Latin and the mediocrity of most people's performance in it. I'd like to just pause right there. Please. If we could. So the forbidding image that resulted was confirmed by the difficulty of acquiring the rudiments of Latin and the mediocrity of most people's performance in it. Hmm. That really is the nub of the complaint against the grammar translation or deductive method. Yes. That a lot of people labor at it very, very hard and make virtually no progress. Right. And in this same book, I learned, it's in another another place, I can't remember, that sometimes Latin is called the gerundive grind. The gerundive grind. Yes, because uh, English has gerunds, right? Running is difficult. Eating is pleasurable. Listening is boring. Things like that. Yeah. Those are gerunds, right? Latin has uh, gerunds also. Currere, running, right? Also in different cases, like currendi and currendo and currendum. But Latin also has gerundives, yes. verbal adjectives, right? Like you can say something along the lines of um, librorum legendorum causa, for the sake of books to be read. Yes. You know, which you would say, for the sake of reading books, something like that. Exactly. But English has no gerundive. English has no passive, no passive verbal adjective. And so this was taken to be one of the greatest difficulties in going from English to the study of Latin. There's no gerundive in ah, English. Okay. Where is the uh, analogy? Where's the point of comparison? It's the gerundive grind. Okay. Okay. All right. You down with the gerundive I, grind? I, you know, I always loved the gerundive. Yeah? Yes. Yeah, like um, the woman who cuts my hair is Amanda. Mm-hmm. And so you know, I took great pleasure in telling her that her name means... To well, be loved. To be loved, or it, in right. some senses, must be loved, right? Right. That, 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 uh, the paraphrastic. Right. right. Amanda est Amanda. Yes. Amanda has to be loved. Has to be loved, right. No, uh, omnibus, by everybody. Yeah, exactly, right. Yeah, everyone must have loved. She didn't enjoy it as much as, as I enjoyed telling her that. She was kind of, <laughs> oh. D- did you tip well? That's that's great. I, I always tip well. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. You are Dutch, though, right? Ooh, Ooh I just alienated a large right. portion of he, our he went there. Michigan audience. Uh, let me keep reading. Okay. okay. <laughs> it is hardly surprising that some of its peculiarities without parallels in this or that modern language have caused Latin to be imagined in strange or monstrous forms. Here it comes. Here it is. The gerundive, whose function is baffling to an English speaker, was once caricatured as an exotic creature attacking peaceful pronouns. <laughs> that's good, that's, isn't that's it? That's very good. Before being captured by the emblematic Victorian grammarian Benjamin Kennedy. In their own way, school children made the same gesture in symbolic fashion by capturing the Latin they were taught integrating it into their universe or adapting it to their needs. They made it more familiar or anyway, less frightening. Yeah. Okay. This is a great book, isn't it? It is. I, I need to read this. Yep. This sounds really interesting. Right. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, what are the, what's he saying there, though, at the end there, that because the gerundive was, was so e- exotic that um, p- uh, kids studying Latin just kind of naturally kind of dumb the Latin down to make it kind of fit what they're familiar with or... Let's see, <clears throat> by capturing the Latin they were taught, uh, I think the idea is, despite the the relative mediocrity of most students in the study of it, yeah, they made some peace with it at some point. They got enough of it to get through it and get out of it. Gotcha. And in fact, uh, there's another really interesting anecdote in this book. I don't remember where it is. But during the, um, I think it's the early 19th century, like 1830s, in the British schools, the teachers at these, you know, hoity-toity British schools had been using the same texts to teach the kids Latin for so long 
that the students would pass cribs, you know, cheat sheets yeah. from grade to grade, but they were sophisticated enough to introduce new errors in subsequent grades oh my gosh. so that the teacher wouldn't realize this is a crib. It's uh, stolen from the previous grade level. Wow. Wow. It takes so much genius and <laughs> trouble to cheat. You'd it, think it, it, it'd be easier to learn exactly, the language. Just apply that to learning right. the language, right. So right. I think this is kind of the spirit of what uh, the author is saying here. Yeah. They made some part of it theirs, uh, despite the difficulty. A difficulty arising largely, I would say, from the grammar translation method. Yeah, yeah. It reminds me, I had. Uh, I remember uh, having a conversation with a friend of mine in college, and we, I went to high school with her, and we, t- we started Latin together, and we got to a certain point, and she was going on, she went on to med school and, and, and the like, and she was much more kind of scientifically minded than I was, but then she, I remember she asked me, like, why are you still going on with this, right. right? And she had clearly kind of hit a ceiling with Latin, right? And she just said, I, you know... I, I, I see what it's 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 used for me in kind of vocabulary right and, and that like but she kind of reached a level where it's like you know I I don't understand the utility of this anymore yes. and she had, had kind of had it with the whole grammatical grammatical approach it was just becoming sterile for her the gerundive grind the gerundive grind right well I'm very very sympathetic to what your friend was experiencing because not only do uh, do individuals who give up earlier you might say but even those of us who stick at it much longer we reach plateaus yeah. And to my mind, the um, have better SAT scores, we've talked about this before, Mm -hmm. have a little better um, vocabulary for medicine or law. It's not a sufficient reason to study the language. And that's always the stuff that they crammed into the pamphlets. Of course. Yes. (laughs) And, you know, I've been guilty of some pamphlet cramming. Me too. uh, In the past, right? Uh, I think it's our friend Robert Mack who says um, he's not just reading a pamph, you know, but a smaller pamph like a a pamphlet. (laughs) Pamphlet. Yeah, I've used some of those, you know, cramming techniques in terms of um, here are the the practical reasons you should study this language. But mm-hmm. just buy a book of uh, Greek and Latin medical terminology and read that instead. Right. If that's your purpose. Yeah. But if your purpose is to read a language to get the joy of communicating in a way that's unfamiliar, yeah. If you want to know the height of some mountain, Google it. Yeah. If you want to know what it's like to stand on top of the mountain. Climb it. Yeah, yeah. and see the sunrise or something like that. No, I'm not going to do that either. No, but no way. It's I'll exhausting. Be, I'll be down in base camp with a <laughs> Latin text and a box of donuts. But, <laughs> right, But right. the analogy is apt. <laughs> yes. It holds. Absolutely, right. Well, I think it always it, it brings me back around to it. always rubbed me the wrong way when... The, even the question, you know, what, you know, what's the practical right. benefit? What's, you know, what, what's the sausage I can make out of this, right? And you can give them these pamphlet answers, but it's really to miss the bigger, the bigger uh, panorama. What you should say in that instance is your question is a non sequitur. Oh. And then, and then refuse to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did there. Mm-hmm. All right. All right, so Dave, how are we going deeper this week? Like, what exactly are we going to get down to? If you can tell me in practical terms. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about etymology. Excellent. Including the etymology of guru, which I learned this week, which is fascinating. I should have known this, but I did not. Mm-hmm. We're going to talk about uh, a few ways that words get adapted into Latin because and phrases because we're using, remember, the duck book. Yes. Right? 1, 000, first thousand words in Latin. Stephen, Am- I'm sorry, Heather Amory, Stephen Cartwright is the illustrator. Our yep. friend Patrick uh, Owens was the Latin expert. And then we're going to go through a number of different strategies. I know I, I wrote down 16, 17, 18 different tips. Okay. Uh, if we were really sophisticated, we'd put these into some kind of a document um, to share with people. But maybe this will go into Farago. Oh, right? the, the, uh, the, our text that we're... This is what I'm illustrating, right? You act like this is unfamiliar to you, Winkle? <laughs> Come on. You're supposed to say, oh, right. Yes. The illustrations are the, well on their way. That's it. Well, they're all, they're, all, they're all up here. I'm, I'm pointing to my head. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So maybe we'll cover some of that in there, but about 16 or 17 different tips that I think will really help you become a better Latinist. And uh, if they don't, at least you maybe find it entertaining along the way. Excellent. So this is going to be practical to some degree. That's my intention. Practical if you want to learn more Latin. Yes. Well, tell us about uh, where does the word guru come from? All right. So I did a little bit of research. This is from Etim Online, right? Etim Online. The Sanskrit guru, it's a Sanskrit word. Mm -hmm. Did Did you study any Sanskrit? 
No. Uh, in grad school? I did not. I, I teach a world religions course now, and when we when I, we cover Hinduism, I get a little bit into that, right. into that, but I have not studied Sanskrit. I haven't either, but there was always a lot of buzz in grad school, classics grad school, right? Remember Peter mentioned uh, Akkadian, right? Knowing some Akkadian. Right. Uh, if you are in biblical studies, people like to go for Akkadian, which I understand is a you know, a contemporary language of biblical Hebrew, yep. or they might want to study a little bit of Syrian, things like that. Mm -hmm. If you're a classicist, as we are, Sanskrit is kind of like that, right? Yeah. It's that um, the mysterious, a little bit distant, but if you only learn Sanskrit, then you'd really understand Proto-Indo-European, right. Pi, and the uh, the Greek and Latin, which descend from it. But, yeah, that was always kind of my sense is that to study Sanskrit is to get uh, as close as you can get to kind of that mysterious kind of um, you know, pre Tower of Babel language, right? Right. right. Yeah, yeah. At yeah. least for what we do, right. right? For that that family of languages. Yes. So, the Sanskrit guru word is cognate with the Latin gravis. Isn't uh -huh. that interesting? Which means heavy, grave, weighty, or serious. So, you know, when we floated this idea, how to be a Latin guru? Uh, obviously, I take pride in my work, and I work hard at it. I, hopefully, everybody takes pride in their work. But to present oneself as a Latin guru, that's kind of bold and perhaps prideful, right? I was comforted when I read this because I realized, okay, maybe I can say I'm a Latin guru in the sense that I'm just really serious about it. Serious, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or weighty and, you know, getting more weighty each year. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I say this in all seriousness when I... When I think of you as a scholar, the, uh, the gravitas comes to mind. Mm. You have, you have, you Just have that kind of lumber around in a rotund fashion. Is this what we're talking about? Yeah, metaphorically speaking. All right. <laughs> yes. Right. So yeah, I like this a lot. Yeah, and it's also cognate um, with the Greek word barus, which gives us such words as barometer, right? Which mm -hmm. measures the atmospheric pressure. It's heavy, right? Right. All three derive from the Proto-Indo-European -Indo root gera. Uh, so. Guru and Grawis and Barus, heavy, weighty, serious about something. Okay. So that's where guru comes from. Interesting. <clears throat> now, I, I once knew a bariatric surgeon. Okay. You know what a bariatric surgeon is, right? That's something down south right? no. in the body. Right? <laughs> yeah, well, tummy tucks, yeah. and uh, it's for weight loss. Yeah. Right? Oh, you know, right, right, you right. You can have a... a um, I don't know, it's a, what do they call it? Some kind of a stitch and, stitch and cut or something. Make your stomach smaller down to the size of a little teaspoon right, so right. you can lose weight. Yes, yes. Bariatric surgeon. They do that Does kind of all thing. that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, so this particular bariatric, here's the setup. This yeah. particular bariatric surgeon that I know, it was pretty well off. You know, he's, he was pretty financially successful. And so I said to him, hey, are you just living off the fat of the land? <laughs> <laughs> was there did it, did it did it get a laugh yeah i don't think you really got it at first it took oh, a while man so so what, now how does that work here so the the, the, the heavy fat no bari bari bariology is the study of being overweight being overweight okay being too heavy too heavy okay right yeah so that's where it comes from interesting so it's barus and then iatros which is a doctor right iatros like a pediatrician there and we so go forth, right yeah, bariatrics. bariatrics. Now I like that because you know when when I hear the word guru, it conjures up in my in my mind the yogi sitting on the top of the mountain with a long beard. That right, you have to go through you know, you know days of journey to go and you get one question to right. ask. Right, <clears throat> um, kind of a it becomes kind of a cartoon, a caricature in my mind. But this kind of brings it back down to um, the seriousness that the word implies. Exactly so. So as we move along, yep. uh, let's look at the meanings of some words as it comes to the study of languages, right? Let's do it. So etymology, right? Where does etymology come from? So we're doing the etymology of etymology? <laughs> yeah. Okay, this I is, like it. This is the Ad Nauseam podcast, yeah, right? Some, right? What do some of our uh, what do some of our listeners say? They say, don't turn away from the deeply esoteric. One guy I remember said, say, yeah, dive right in. You guys go right up to the edge of esoteric. Terraka, and yeah. then you back off a little bit. And he, did no. not, he did not like that. No, he said jump right in. Okay, yeah. So the etymology of etymology. Yeah. Right? So it's an old French word, 14th century, from Latin etymologia, from Greek etymologia, which means, quote, the analysis of a word to find its true origin. Uh -huh. Properly, the study of the true sense of a word, and logia, of course, means study of, and etymon, true sense, original meaning which perhaps is cognate with the Sanskrit satya. Sanskrit again. Once more, okay. the Gothic sunji is the Old English su, which means true, from a Proto-Indo-European word that means to be stable. 
Aha. Isn't that interesting? That's really interesting. Yeah. And perhaps the most important part to me is that Latinized, the term etymologia, Cicero Latinized it as a veriloquium. Oh, veriloquium. Okay. True the, word. The true word, kind of like the, the nugget of the word, right? You yeah. remember that commercial when we were children? How many licks does it take? To get to the center of a... Of a Tootsie Roll Tootsie, Tootsie roll. Pop, right. Yeah. And there was, for some reason, an owl, of course, because owls are always lurking around trying to grab your Tootsie Roll Tootsie Pops Yeah. and lick you know, through the center, and then he would take a bite You'd out of it. You'd take a bite out yeah. And there you'd get the veriloquium, right? That's the heart, the center of the word. Yes. Now, if we're clever enough, later in the same episode, we will connect that idea to the study of Latin. We're going to do that? Uh, we're going to try. Okay, good. <laughs> if, we're, if we're clever enough. Right, if we're clever enough. If we're clever enough. All right. <clears throat> si sapientissimi asemus, if we were, you know, most wise. We'll see yes. what happens. What about the next one? Um, derivative. Right. Yes. What do we got going on there? Well, have you been called this before? Derivative? Yeah. Oh, daily. <laughs> Yeah, my children. Yeah. yeah, so I learned this from a student way back when. His first name was Roger, and he knows who he is. He's probably not listening, but uh, it was delivered to me with a little bit of sarcasm and point, which is always hard when you're the teacher, when the student kind of gives you a bit of a, a look and says, um, you know, you're, you're doing this wrong, stupid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was right, and I learned, and I'll always remember. I was using the terms derivative and cognate interchangeably okay a rookie move yeah, right? yeah, yeah rookie rookie move so a cognate is a word that has a um well a cognate a twin a cousin that's what cognatus means mm -hmm. in another language so the latin pater meaning father and the greek pater meaning father are cognates yes because they are descended from some common ancestor right there we go like siblings you have a brother i do right so why do you and brother look similar because we descend from the same parents. Correct. Yes. But a derivative means a word that descends from another word, right? So why does your son look like you? Because he's descended from you. Yes. So he is a derivative in some sense. I see. So yeah. that's how it works in the nature of language. Okay. It All took right. me a while to figure that out. So, for example, the uh, English word um, <clears throat> patriot is from the Greek patriotes, someone who's a lover of country. Mm -hmm. So why does the... Why does the English word patriot and the English word paternal, why do they sound kind of similar? Well, it's not because one has descended from the other. It's because paternal, which is from Latin paternus or paternalis, meaning of or relating to father, adjectival, and Greek patriotes, the two of them are descended from some prior, prior form. Prior root, yes. Right. Okay. So that's a really important distinction that I didn't understand until quite a ways into my study. Was this the thing that your student called you out on? Or Yes. You, okay, okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, I'm, and even though it was painful, right. you know, because when you're the authority, you don't want to look stupid. Yeah. Um, and I was much younger and I guess thought I didn't look as stupid as I really did. <laughs> but I learned it. Yeah. You know, it, was, um, it was very good. So that's a derivative, one word descended from another, like, uh, I don't know, the, the Spanish peligro is a, deriv is a, uh, a derivative of the Latin um, periculum, right? Danger. P right. Yeah. Peligro, you wouldn't think so. They don't look that much alike, but that's where it comes from. Right. Whereas a cognate, you know, uh, English father, right, and uh, Latin pater, um, father doesn't come from pater, they both come from some other source. Right. So that was really something interesting for me to learn. Yeah, yeah. And then we got loan words. We got loan word. Now, <clears throat> a loan word, I think, would be like etymologia, right, which we just talked about. So etymologia comes from Greek into Latin and from Latin then into English. That's a loan word. So Cicero was uh, bothered that Latin didn't have some word to capture the notion of etymology. Mm -hmm. So rather than using etymologia, Cicero said, I'm, I'm going to use veriloquium. And come up with my own, right? Right. An authentic Latin word to express the idea. Gotcha, gotcha. Right. So a loan word can also be called a calc, uh, which is something that I learned actually pretty recently, C-A-L-Q-U-E, for those who are taking notes. You think anybody's taking notes? I expect that all of our listeners are taking notes out you there. You think so? Yeah, okay. absolutely. So tell us about calcs, Jeff. So calcs, this comes from uh, a master's thesis from one Eleanor Detreville. Okay. And she writes... In morphological calking, you know, I went out calking the other day. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. With all the snow? All the snow. Did you take along a lunch just in case things got rough? Oh, of course. You always take along a lunch because when you go calking, you're out there for a yeah, while. Yeah, that's true. All right. In morphological calking, 
A Roman writer with sufficient knowledge of the Greek would translate each individual Greek morpheme into its Latin equivalent, and the morpheme order in the Latin word reflected that of the Greek word. One often noted example in the literature is pronomen, leading to English pronoun, first used by Varro at De Lingua Latina 845. Calked upon the Greeks, antonumia, morphological calking allowed authors to preserve the prestige of their own language and express their linguistic abilities. Hmm. This okay. is a master's thesis. Yeah. Yeah, 2007. And when I found this, I thought, this is exactly what we need. And uh, I was happy. I don't know this woman, Eleanor Detreville, mm -hmm. read a little bit of the thesis. Very nice. I thought, you know, a lot of master's theses, theses, they don't get read very much afterward. And I thought, this is really valuable information. Right. Uh, I learned a lot from this about uh, calcing and antonumia. Right? Yeah. You take the Greek word, drop it right down into Latin. Excellent. Well, I'm sure wherever she is out there, I mean, Eleanor, she should be very pleased at having her, <laughs> I don't know. her thesis uh, tagged like this. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> so a few other terms, yep. right? A mundagreen. This one I had never heard of before. What's a mundagreen? A mundagreen is misheard lyrics. That's what it is? Yes. So, uh, Like the Bon Jovi song, I Just Died in Your Barn Tonight. <laughs> Maybe that's not Bon Jovi. No, that was uh, Cutting Crew. Cutting Crew, yes. Yeah, I just one Hit Wonder. Yeah. Right, I died in your barn tonight. <laughs> you don't know that one? I know that one very well, exactly. What, what is the real lyric? I just died in your arms tonight. Ah, uh, yes. right. Yeah, you yeah. know some of these, don't you? Oh, the, yeah. The Monda Greens? Yes. You know, my, my brother and I uh, are, are well known for for um, messing up lyrics and only coming to realize what their true lyrics are years later. Give us an example. Well, uh, this was actually fairly recent. You know the song uh, Africa by Toto? Oh, yes. Bless the ring, right? So there's a line in there where they, they say, um, like Kilimanjaro rises like Olympus above the Serengeti. Yes, it's a real stretch to rhyme Serengeti in there. Or it even is. even fit it in the, exactly right. in the line. But I always heard it okay. as like Kilimanjaro rises like a leprous above the Serengeti. <laughs> <laughs> because I because no bear with me here. I refuse. I'm bearing. Okay, so I thought leprous is kind of like a cool term for like a, a, a like something bad. No, not like a like a queen leopard, like a leprous. Oh, a leprous. Yes, right. <laughs> because I thought who would describe a mountain by comparing it to another mountain? <laughs> I refuse. Like like Kilimanjaro rises like Olympus. So I mean, uh. it's a classical reference, but. You don't describe a mountain oh, I by comparing it to another mountain. You really thought about this deeply. I did. And you had a, you had a really cogent criticism of the lyrical choice there. I did, because when I, I finally, I don't remember how it came to my attention, what the real lyrics was, but when I read that, I thought, I was so disappointed. Hmm. And I stand by my mishearing as a better lyric. Okay. Okay. You got another example? I do. I'll, this is from my brother. Okay. Right? There was years ago, there was another one-hit wonder. Um, you couldn't go anywhere in, like, I think, 1997 without hearing this. It was a song called Tub Thumping by a band called Chumbawamba. <laughs> and the chorus goes, I get knocked down, but I get up again. No, you're never going to keep me down. You ever hear that one? No. Okay. Maybe I probably have. I probably have, but I didn't listen so very my, closely. So the, the song is called Tub Thumping. Okay. Right? And so my brother heard the song, and he right. knew the title of the song, so he assumed, I th rightly so, that... If your song is called Tump Thubbing, the song's probably going to mention a tub right. somewhere. Sure, makes right? sense. So he heard the lyric as, I get no tub like I want to get because I have no lead guitar. <laughs> and he sang that for years. That's way off. It's way off. But again, I stand by, that's the better lyric. Uh, <laughs> it's got nothing to do with the song. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I know. All right, the only original one I have before we return from the circuitous uh, what do we call this? Tangent or yeah. digression? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, both tangent and digression, by the way, are Latin at words. Yes, they are. Okay. Yeah. Uh, to the topic, and uh, this is one from uh, one of my least favorite uh, performers, <laughs> Phil Collins. You know Phil Collins? Of course. Uh, a drummer. A drummer. Right. Most famous for his time in Genesis. I yeah. don't like his voice at all. I Pe can understand People that. like his voice. I find it so annoying. Yeah. So he has this song. I don't know. Uh, what's the title of the song? It's called Invisible Touch. Invisible it's Touch. What we, it's a Genesis song, but he's singing lead. Okay. Right? Yeah. right. All right. So I thought that the line, she seems to have an invisible touch -a, <laughs> I thought it was, he was saying, she sees the halftime video <laughs> talk show. <laughs> and I thought, I don't know why she's so upset about that, but when she saw the halftime video talk show, <laughs> right, right, exactly, it sent her into orbit. Now, again, yours is the better lyric. <laughs> That's better. Now, I got to ask you, I mean, so when you heard that, 
you didn't know, like you didn't hear the DJ say, "Hey, it's Genesis with Invisible Touch." You didn't assume like that. Those no, words. I'm are not sh- sure I knew the title of the song. Oh, okay, okay, right, right. I just always heard the chorus. She sees the halftime video talk show. That's brilliant. It it fits. It fits. It Perfectly. scans. It's perfect. Right, right. That's so great. a couple more terms, and then uh, we're gonna have to hit the break pretty just soon. One one quick question though. Okay. Why is it called a Mondegreen? Do you know that? What? Um, I don't. Somebody does. Okay. I could have done some more research. Right. I think I think Monda Green is itself a Monda Green. Oh, it is. Yeah, I'm quite sure of that. Actually, it, I just a, don't remember. The word itself is a mishearing of something. Correct. Okay. Yep. Okay. Is a, is a mishearing. Uh, there are a number of really funny ones. Yeah. That maybe the listener can go find. So, neologisms. Right. Sometimes you just have to make up a word, mm-hmm. as our friend Saint Augustine did. Yes. Who shares a birthday with you, Wayne? He does, November 13th. Yeah, that's correct. So yeah. Marcus Aurelius Augustinus Hippenensis, uh, he coined a wonderful Latin word, soliloquium. 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 A, a word by itself? Yeah, well, or, talking or, on your own. Talking on your own, yeah. So instead of a, a dialogue, right, he wrote soliloquies. Ah, yes. A soliloquia, right, where he is the sole speaker. So that originates with him. Yes, isn't that, that fascinating? That's great, yeah. I learned that from Henry Chadwick. And Henry Chadwick wrote a very short introduction to Augustine. Now, we probably have listeners out there who think, very short introduction to Augustine? Dr. Noe, I thought you were a scholar. You pretend to be a scholar. You pose as one. Now you're talking about like these cliff notes? Correct. Kind of stuff. Oh, I do a lot of posing. But these very <laughs> short introductions, you know, which Oxford puts out, mm-hmm. there's sometimes gold in those. And the one that Henry Chadwick wrote on um, Augustine of Hippo, really brilliant. Right. I read it uh, this past summer. And so in there I learned that... Augustine came up with the term soliloquium. It's a neologism. Yeah. And you have a couple others here written down. Yeah, right? these are never going to take hold. Oh. These these are my own. Oh, really? Right? Yeah. Uh, so we have uh, per uh, persebonate? Persebonate. What is that? What is that? It means something that is good in and of itself. It's per se bonum, right? Oh, so per yeah. se bonum, right? Sleep is persebonate. Yeah. Right? So you don't sleep just in order to be awake. It's not instrumental. It's persebonate. Yeah. Friendship is persebonate. Persebonate. Right? If you try to turn your friendship into a tool to achieve another end, that's wicked. Right. You should just enjoy it because it's a persebonate thing. Right? You, it's good. This is great. You got to make this one happen. I'm trying, but no, I just can't get can't, it out there. Can't get it no, out there, right? I've, I've had this word, you know, in reserve in my faretra, my quiver. Uh, for about 15 years, and it's just not catching on. I got you. we got to give it time. All right. The yeah. other one is transliminate. Oh, I, I, I see the word liminal in there. Yeah, you've seen that before. That's one of your favorites. It is. So I think we've talked about it, too. To transliminate means to enter a building. Oh, right. right to cross the threshold. Exactly. You transliminate. Yeah. Probably not going to catch on. So what are you doing here in the hotel lobby? Well, I transliminated a few minutes ago. Right. I, I, no? I like it. No, I, I like it. <laughs> not going to catch on. Oh, well. <clears throat> and okay. lastly... Portmanteau. Portmanteau. Okay. How is that different than a neologism? Well, a portmanteau is when you take two uh, words that exist and Mm. you shove them together. Portmanteau is, as I understand, a French piece of luggage from the 19th century. Okay. On one side, you would put your socks, your dirty clothes, all sorts of things, zip it shut. On the other side, you would put other kinds of mentionables and unmentionables, zip it shut. And then you would put the two halves together like a sandwich. And that's a portmanteau. I like it. So portmanteaus are really popular these days. I think they, in our lifetime, uh, have become overwhelmingly popular. They, they grade on me most of the like time. You don't like them? For the, for the most part. Most of them are really poorly done. Yeah. So when we were kids, there were no portmanteaus. I don't remember that at all. But now everyone's talking about the staycation. That, we're going to take a staycation. That's the that's one I don't like. Is there another one you don't like? Well, I, no. I, I mean, of course, now in the moment, none jump to mind. But I, I saw that you wrote wrote down staycation, and I know that I generally can't stand stuff like no? that. No. Yeah. Some of them are really clever. Do you, what, give me an example of one. That well, you I like thought that. that this was the clever one that I had dreamed up, but it turns out someone else already had done it. Yeah. So you know what a chandelier is, of course, and you know what an earring is, yes. right? So a really large earring would be a chandeliering. Oh, th- is that really something? Somebody's come up with that? So I thought, ah, that's it. That's my portmanteau. <laughs> this is going to be my contribution to the English lexicon. And I raced to the internet only to find everybody's saying that. Somebody beat you to that Yes, one? and then you have that awkward feeling of, did I really think it up? Or did you see or it did somewhere? did I see it somewhere and forgot that I had seen it? That is so frustrating. Yeah, I can identify with that mm-hmm. feeling too. Yeah. Another one that I don't like is hangry. Oh, I can't stand that. You hear that one all the time now. Sometimes when I get really hangry, yeah. I want to have a turducken. <laughs> Another terrible one. I hate that. It's a chicken stuffed inside a duck stuffed inside a turkey. Turkey. It's all the, the, the right. all three Stuffed together. inside your oven and then thrown into the trash. <laughs> That's right. 
<laughs> oh, that's terrible. Right? right. So we've covered the gamut here, right? Yeah. We've had etymologies, cognates, derivatives, mondegreens, calcs, neologisms, portmanteaus, yeah. and uh, what's left? What's, uh, uh, how about malapropisms? Yeah. yeah. I don't know if it's malapropisms or malapropisms. I don't know. But I like them, and I understand you have a story. I do, right? My my wife is particularly talented at at, at uh, c- combining things to uh, to hilarious effect. Now, now, can you tell this on the air? I can't. I think she she wouldn't mind. Okay. Right? So I, I've told this story uh, with her in person many many times. I mean, she's sick of me telling it. But it's your risk that's right. being run here. All right. So what? Um, this might be ten years ago. My wife and I were driving along. Uh, we were both kind of in, in bad moods, mm. and we're kind of snapping at each other. Wrinkle. Yeah. Snapping at that lovely woman. Right. Well, she was snapping at me, too. All right. We were going all right. both ways. And so finally, Beck, she turns to me, and she says, hey, you know, what is your problem? <laughs> and I said, look, I'm sorry. I'm not feeling well. I've been under the weather. And she goes, yeah, well, join the boat. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was laughing so hard, I couldn't drive, and I had to pull over. Uh, and... and- so did you? Did, did I? Did, did I jo- you join the boat? Did I join the boat. I guess in that moment I did. Um, I was laughing so hard, and I mean the beautiful thing was it. It immediately solved the the argument. Oh yeah, Re- resolved the tension. Right. It reunited you in affection and kindness. Yes, because I was sweet. laughing so hard, and she realized what she had said. Right. She's combining join the club. Right. With we're all in the same boat. Right. We join um, the boat. Join the boat. Oh my gosh. She, I she do that on purpose, maybe? No, no, no. Oh, okay. She just come. So a, a couple of other, of other ones uh, from my wife are, um, that's right up my aisle, <laughs> right? So it's an aisle instead of an alley, right? Right. That's a good one. And one time she was she was reacting to something that she thought was just complete nonsense, and she says, "That's a load of crock." <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that's a great combination of two other things. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's wonderful, right. right. One time we were traveling across the country and she was taking a nap in the car and she woke up and she saw kind of the desolate surroundings around us. Right. She says, what kind of ho-bunk town is this? <laughs> <laughs> that's a neologism. That is a neologism, yeah, yes. Or maybe a portmanteau, uh, right? Yeah, ho-bunk. I, I took it to be kind of a, she meant to say podunk. Right. Ho-bunk. Yes. She's, yeah. I'm going to start using that. Yeah, isn't that great? Ho-bunk is perceptinant, I would say. Yes, de- definitely. And with that, yeah. let's go to the commercials. This episode of Odd Nauseam brought to you by Hackett Publishing. For the last 40 years, Hackett Publishing, based in Indianapolis and Cambridge, have been bringing to the public affordable, accessible, and learned translations of uh, great works of literature from um, many corners of, corners of academia, lots of classical stuff there. Um, I love their works. Um, I was just using their translation of the Bacchae in a, my class this week. Mm-hmm. Um, it's great stuff. Um, my students are often, you know, hard up for cash. These are these are yeah, you, they're affordable, aren't they're, they? They're affordable. They're really high quality. Right. Um, the illustrations, the diagrams, all the stuff, um, you know, uh, along with the translation is great. Right. I can't say enough. Yeah. So there are there are other affordable translations. I won't mention the full title, but something thrift editions. You know, people who buy books will know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. And you know, those are those are decent translations, and they're inexpensive. But you could say they're really cheap. Unlike Hackett, right? Yeah. So Hackett has hit that sweet spot, I would say, of like, you know, like you were saying, really high quality material that you don't have to pay an arm and a leg for. Yep. Uh, They have paperback editions of so many of their works. They also have hardcovers of some of my favorite titles. Again, the Lingua Latina Per Se Illustrata, the the philosophical corpus that they offer, Boethius, uh, Plato. They got a new Aristotle series, which looks just like dynamite. Yeah. Uh, And eventually we're going to be talking about their Shakespeare series. The uh, the classical tragedies uh, by Shakespeare, beautiful, beautiful editions. That's right. And um, you can check out their website, hackettpublishing.com, H-A-C-K-E-T-T publishing.com. They've got new stuff coming out all the time. They're, they're also starting to kind of host um, uh, author talks right. online that you can tune into. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, great stuff. Yep. So, listener, if you want to support this podcast, which so many of you have done so generously, we're very grateful, and you want to score yourself some great translations, go to hackettpublishing.com, H-A-C-K-E-T-T, pick out the products you want, drop them into your backpack or shopping vehicle, something like that. Yeah, exactly. And then there's a coupon code. Yes, it's just AN2021. AN ad nauseum 2021, and you will get 20% off. 20%! It's huge, and also free shipping. Check it out. 
This episode also brought to you by the Moss Method. Dave, what's the Moss Method? Moss Method for Greek is a program that I have developed that will take you from neophyte to erudite. What does that even mean? <laughs> Come on, you know, Winkle. Okay. Take you from little or no knowledge of Greek That's to right. a really high level of confidence and ability. Excellent. So you can read a whole range of authors from the Greek corpus, everything from Homer right down to the New Testament. Wow. And um, now I, I hear that there's like a there's a huge special going on yes, right now. The Blafram on side. The Blafram on side. Nobody likes that, but what do you mean? I love it. You like that title? Yeah. It's the Black Friday Monday Cyber. I had to make it rhyme. So. Yeah. We're offering 15% off. It actually started already. It started on Saturday, November 20, and it will continue for 10 days until November 30. You can get 10% off the Mo- I'm sorry, 15% off the Moss Method course. Now, this is uh, a set of four different modules that I have developed, teaches you all the grammar, all the technical terms and so forth, but it does so in a fun way by reading actual stories. That sounds great. So what, no, what else do, would a, a subscriber get? Yeah. Well, they get something that I think is really quite unique in the world of self-taught language instruction. They get one hour per week with me in our Moss Method office hours, or to use a portmanteau, the Moffis hours. The mo- oh, man. Right. I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of sticks in the head, though. So once a week, we get together with Moss students from all over the world. We've had them come from the Pacific Northwest, from parts of Asia, uh, all over the United States. We get together in the U.K., And we just talk Greek. Any questions that you have, I guide them through the course, and then they can ask me anything they want about the New Testament, classical authors. Not you, some flunky. No, no, no. No flanky involved. It's me. (laughs) It's me. Oh, excellent. They don't drag someone out of some hobunk place. (laughs) No, I'm teaching them directly via Zoom. It's great fun. That sounds great. So you you work on the course on your own, but with my constant guidance, I'm helping you out. So So what should somebody who's interested do? Well, they should go to mossmethod.com mm-hmm. and they should watch the free instructional videos, the Moss Method office hours. We just redesigned the website. See if this is the kind of program that's right for you. We want you in the right program and see if I can help take you to the next level, whether you're a beginner or intermediate uh, in your Greek study. So it's a great program. I have a couple other, Jeff, if I may. Please. I have a couple of other big announcements to make yeah. about some of my online instruction. And that is, I have a new course on Cicero's De Natura Deorum, The Nature of the Gods. Yeah. And this is a live course starting the first week of January, 2022. Uh, it's got 10 spots and uh, nine of them are already filled. Wait, wait, there's one left? There's one spot left. What? And in fact, by the time this airs, it might be filled. Oh. But the good news is, if you want to study Cicero's De Natura Deorum, or I'm with me. Uh, you want to learn some Roman philosophy, some deep Latin, beautiful stuff. Uh, but maybe you don't want to have the pressure of my calling on you. Maybe you, maybe your Latin's not quite good enough, you think, or you're not confident. You can participate in the class as an audit. Okay. You can take the course for $75. You can go to Latin per diem, latinperdm.com, click the banner ad, and sign up to audit Cicero's De Natura Deorum. Should be a great course. Sounds fantastic. But there's more. There's more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This, this this ad segment, you know, is going to get a little long, but our listeners are patient, or they can just skip through, or they're not they're not going to want to miss the big ratio announcement. That's right. We got a big one coming on there. Yeah, hang on. The final thing is, I'm developing a, a beginner's Latin course based on lingua Latina per se illustrata, oh, wow. and this is coming out in January, and I think this is going to be really big. I think people are really going to enjoy this opportunity once again to learn Latin from me in a non-threatening, accessible way with uh, continued access to my expertise. And this is uh, with your favorite textbook That's for, right. for learning Latin. Yeah, yep. it's going to be affordable, and uh, I think it's going to be really good. People are going to love it. I'm hopeful. Sounds great. All right, Jeff, and now the big announcement yeah. from Ratio. Yeah, what, what's going on here? Well, uh, as we discussed, come on, you know this. I know, I'm, I'm just feeding you. <laughs> right. I'm feeding you. Yeah. Uh, Mark, our friend at Ratio, you know, the uh, inventor of the Ratio 6 and the Ratio 8, he's decided that he's going to share some of that goodness for free with our ad nauseum listeners. That's right. We're going to give away a Ratio 6. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. This is a premium coffee machine. We don't have to go through, you know, the description we love to go through about how the brewing and the blooming and the, you know, plutonium carafe and the scorch <laughs> pad and the brackish tank. Yeah, they know how it goes. They know. Yeah. You can get one of these Ratio 6s by entering yourself in a special drawing that we're having. That's right. So... I think beginning, uh, not this episode, but our next episode. Number 65. Right. That's right. Um, sometime in those episodes, yeah. we are going to mention a secret code. That's right. Um, and not in the ad section. No, no, no. In 65, 66, and 67, 
you listen to the episode, and like Jeff said, we're going to mention a secret code, right, not during the ad segment, you go to racialcoffee.com slash A-N-C-O, right, the typical coffee code we enter. You enter your information and that code, and you're entered into the raffle to win a race of six. This is huge. It is. Yeah. So why enter the new year drinking that same kind of bilge water? Yeah. Sign up. Maybe you'll win the race of six, and then we'll announce it on the air in, I think it will be in episode number 68. Fabulous. I'm very excited this about This is that. exciting, yeah. isn't it? That's right. All right, Dave. So as we get back into it, um, we've got uh, you've uh, written down a number of these principles, right? That's going to help you, that help our listeners become Latin gurus. That's exactly right. And the first principle is I want to talk about the verb placet. Okay. So placet is a second declension, second conjugation verb, and it means to be pleasing to. Mm-hmm. So this is a very easy way to expand your comfort with and your knowledge of the Latin language is to use placet in the singular or placent in the plural with various datives that have to do with people. Okay. So if I wanted to say that Jeff likes the podcast, right, I can say podcast Jeff Plockett. The, the podcast is pleasing to Jeff. Correct. If yes. you want to put it in that kind of English way, yes. exactly so, that's what it means. Yes. Now, I didn't decline either the word podcast or Jeff, right? Right. but it's pretty clear. Now, let's make it a little more sophisticated. Instead of saying Jeff, let's say you, right? So the second person singular is Tibby, right? Podcast, Tibby Plockett. Jeff likes the podcast. Mm -hmm. So you can leave some words untranslated, right? You can bring some words directly, they're a loan word, right? A calc, directly into the target language and not worry about it too much. Okay. So one time I'm listening to Luigi Miralia, Aloysius, and he's giving this blistering, beautiful YouTube lecture. You can go look it up about how to speak Latin, and it's all in Latin. And at one point he says McDonald's, Coca-Cola, right, Mm -hmm. Uh, in his Italian accent. And, of course, those words, being proper nouns and such, there's no reason to try to represent them in the target language. You just drop them right down in there. Yeah. And all the other words retain their proper form. Gotcha, yes. So you're using a Dell computer, right? Mm -hmm. So I can say Dell, Tibby Plockett, do you like Dell? And how would you respond, right? So most people are looking for some way to say yes or no. Yeah. But that's not how it works in Latin. Okay. You typically repeat one of the words of the question in the answer, right? So if I said Dell Tibby Plockett, you would say... Uh, Mihi Plockett. Mihi Plockett, right? Yeah. yeah, I like it. And Latin is so flexible, you can even just say mihi, right? Mm. I do. Or even just Plockett. It pleases. It does. I right. like it. Right? right, right, right. Now, you can get more sophisticated, right? Always when you're trying to improve your ability, start small and build incrementally, right? So now, instead of just saying one thing, right, you can say, uh, hike mensa, this this table, mensa. You like this table? Hike mensa to be plakant. Ah, mihi plakat. Now add something else into it, and now you'll have to change just one element, right? So now, hike mensa, mensa, this uh, table, at cella and chair. Now what do we need to change? The verb has to become plural. Yeah, right. so not plakat, but plakent. Plakent, yeah. yeah. Hike mensa at cella to be plakent. Now, what have we done? We've changed, we added another subject, and we've changed, therefore, the verb to plural, right? Now, these lessons are simple, but the way to become a guru is to practice them a large number of times until you don't have to think about it. Right, right, right. So let's take an analogy from athletics, right? We both were, you know, sportsers of sorts, right? Yes. I can remember trying to learn how to play baseball, and I had one of those pitchbacks, Right. This is yes. a this is a metal frame with a a kind of a net. Yeah. And you stand there and throw the baseball into it. Had that too. Had that too. Yeah. Back and forth and back and forth. I did that thousands of times. You know, I never made the all stars, but I learned how to catch a baseball. Yes. So so often when we're learning Latin or any other language, we want to just learn the Latin, the the lesson once in a few minutes and move on, but then you have to look up the word and the construction forever thereafter. Exactly. You know that feeling. Of course. Very frustrating. Right. You look up one word and then you don't really learn it, so you got to look it up repeatedly. It's much better to invest on the front end, right? Mm-hmm. So get get the plaquette and the mihi, right? And the plaquette tibi and the plaquette mihi, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, I like donuts. Cuppedia. That's the word for donut. 
uh, Cuppedia mihi placent. I like donuts, mm -hmm. but maybe I don't like something else. Those trees are creeping me out. Arborace mihi non placent. Yeah. And then you just do that hundreds of times. Now, you might say, it's incredibly tedious to spend that much time on one construction or one verb. Well, yes, it is. But if you front load the work, you're going to know that probably for the rest of your life. Exactly. exactly. Instead of just coming back to something you learned in a shadowy and inadequate way over and over, which is incredibly frustrating. Right. Now, you start, you, it's interesting to me that you started with this, this uh, plaquette, plaquette, uh, plaquette. Um, and is one of the reasons you chose it because, you know, in English, it's, you know, it's not this table is pleasing to me. It's I like the table. Correct. And so it's, it's a, a different construction. It's a different construction. Yes. So it kind of forces you to think in a, in a different kind of yes. way. Yes. Yeah. So the first lesson is to break English expectations. Mm -hmm. So many times students are quite, you know, the phenomenon, disappointed that when they're dealing with Latin, it isn't like English. Yes. Well, that is such an important and foundational lesson to learn. And I think this is one of those constructions that teaches that lesson yeah. quite well. And you can combine English and Latin words together, right? I like the tree. I don't like, I don't know, some proper noun. I like the tree. I don't like Pizza Hut. Right. <laughs> I actually like Pizza Hut. No yeah. sponsorship. So yeah. <laughs> Arbor, mihi plaquet. Yeah. Pizza Hut, mihi non plaquet. Yeah, right? Yeah. Just drop it right down in there. And after you've learned that lesson, well, then learn the um, the opposite of plaquette, which is displicate. Mm. Displicate also takes a dative, right? Now, I don't think maybe once in this conversation I've mentioned that mihi and tibi and nobis and wobis, that these are datives, but you don't even have to know that in order to use the construction. Right. It, and if you're teaching someone else, it's better not to tell them that until they're way comfortable with it. Yes. 100, 150 different examples. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. Uh, because why clog their minds up with a dative? It doesn't mean anything to them. If the language they know, like English, is I like pizza, right? Right, right, right. right. So um, what is it? Placenta Neapolitana, the word for pizza, Placenta Neapolitana, mihi placet. Yeah. How do you translate that? I like pizza. I like pizza. Exactly. Yeah. One of the things I like to do, I probably look like a freak show walking around. Uh, I think I mentioned in our previous podcast, I'm very slowly trying to teach myself some modern Greek. And so when I'm out for a walk, I like to look around me and say, okay, what things around me do I know the words for? Right. What do I not know the words for? And actually, one of the recent constructions we, um, I was learning is modern Greek does the same thing. Mm -hmm. You don't say, I like something with a direct object. You, right. It's a muarese. This is, it pleases me. Yeah. And so I'm talking to myself and, and finding things, you know, this road pleases me. Yep. And you just kind of talk to yourself. And exactly. I, find, I find that really helpful. Absolutely. That's one of the principles later on, exactly the same thing. And uh, uh, my friend David Morgan of Blessed Memory, this is how he taught himself to speak Latin at a very high level, precisely what you're describing. Is that right? Okay, yep. great. He just, uh, we can skip ahead to that principle, I guess. He just tried to describe his daily activities into a voice recorder oh. and listened to it and, you know, feedback, a feedback loop. So now he can see... I did that pretty well, and I've since learned that's wrong. So I'm mm. not going to do that the next time. So constant, careful practice. Yeah. And uh, that works. It works in a brilliant fashion. You can also incorporate writing, right? Letter writing. Write a journal in Latin. If you are uh, religious, write prayers in Latin, mm. right? So there are a number of words for prayer, like precor, right? Gives us the English word imprecate. There's rogo, right? You ask someone for something. Mm -hmm. uh, you ask the gods, you know, ask God to do something for you. So you shouldn't ever try to learn something in isolation. It's just impossible. You have to have a context. Like you're saying, you're walking around trying to learn some modern Greek, mm -hmm. connecting it to your experience. That's right. Uh, so, okay, so what else have we got? Second principle, the dative of possessor, right? It builds nicely or follows nicely from Plaquet. The dative of possessor is better than habeo nine times out of ten. Now why, now, why is that? Well, habeo doesn't really mean to be the owner of something. It means, and you know, I can be corrected on this by other Latinists who are listening if they'd like. It means uh, either to have temporary possession of something or um, to have something in one's purview, perhaps. It's not really the idea of ownership. Now, the so-called dative of possessor, you take the same pronouns and nouns and such that you were using with Plaquette, 
And now you just put the noun in there and you use est for the singular, right? This is my book. Liber mihi est. This is my book. Yeah. Right? These are not my shoes. Calque i mihi non sunt. Right? Yeah. Calque i mihi non sunt. Now, what about the book that we're talking about? Well, here's where you can practice using the language of the book with the very simple construction to add vocabulary. So the, the first set, right, is entitled... Uh, domus, domus, right? So then we have a picture of a latrina, the bathroom. All right, so how do you want to say, mm, I don't have a bathroom, right? Latrina mihi non est, I don't own a bathroom. Now, after you've done this for a hundred different examples from the book, then if you want to get more sophisticated, you can say nulla latrina, nulla with the adjective, nulla latrina mihi est, which arguably may be a little more idiomatic, right? Because mm. nobody says, uh, I don't own a bathroom, right? It, that's not really very idiomatic. What they're trying to say is, you know, I, I really I really don't have access to a bathroom, right? Nulla latrina mihi. Gets closer to that. Yes. Yeah. But, you know, those nuances, right, are something that you learn after lots of study. So never make the... Uh, the best, the enemy of the good, or you won't make progress. Right. right. So how would we say if we look here at the picture of the living room, the cessorium, right? right the, the sitting room. The sitting room. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I've got a pillow, right? Poenus mihi est. And turn it around and make it a question. Do you have a pillow? Poenus tibi est. Right? Now, oftentimes when a student begins learning Latin, no, I have a pillow. Let's see. That's a pull. Weenus, and then if I can put it into the accusative, I would say poenum if I can remember that. And then I want to say habeo, or maybe if they look in the dictionary, they find teneo, which means to hold on to something. Right. You could be grasping someone else's pillow. I just bypass all that and practice the dative of possessor with every noun in the book yeah. until you're really comfortable with it, right? Cataclysmus. Cataclysmus mihi est, right? I have a shower head. <laughs> Montela mi he est. Right? Montela, that's a, that's a towel. I got a towel. A towel, right? yeah. Then we wander into the bedroom. Cubiculum, right? The cubiculum. Do you have a comb? Uh, pecten to be asked. Do you have a comb? Pecten to be asked. Now, some people will say at this point, Dr. Noe, I want to read Cicero. I want to read Erasmus and St. Augustine. Yeah. You know? Well, I do too, Right. But Augustine and Erasmus and so forth, how did they learn Latin? They didn't start by reading the most difficult things. Right. They started out by speaking and learning basic everyday kinds of things. And they continued using these sorts of words, yeah. right? Uh, when Augustine is in the garden and the famous uh, scene in Confessions Book 2, right? He says uh, something like, um, Arbor erat, right? There was a tree, right? I'm st- paraphrasing. It was a pear tree, pear to the merot, right? Those are simple, basic words, Mm -hmm. right? So uh, just because you're talking about complicated things doesn't mean you're going to use a simple vocabulary. Right, 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 right. I love this book in that uh, I I can see this kind of this exercise would be, I mean, so useful if having all these things in front of you on one page. That's right. Practicing these basic constructions, but also by, you know, uh, building... Right, a fairly sophisticated vocabulary. Yes, quite comprehensive. Time. It's yeah. a thousand words. Yeah. So here's the advice of my friend, uh, acquaintance. I'd like to be his friend, Daniel Peterson, who's a, a world-renowned Latin speaker. He wrote an article a few years back and said, "Here's the way to improve your Latin. If you're really serious about it, go around your house, take sticky notes, and label everything <laughs> that's in your house. Yeah, and then for a week, as you're going around, similar to what you were doing in the neighborhood, practice these constructions. Right? Oh." You know, there's my cupboard. Armario mihi est. I have a cupboard, right? Or um, I see the cupboard, right? So you go past the dative of possessor, add in another verb, a video, right? Yeah. Uh, and if you can't remember how to put the endings on, say, masculine and feminines, the neuters, of course, the object case and the subject case are ex- identical. The same. Right? Yep. So I have a cupboard. Armario mihi est, right? I see the cupboard. Armario video. You don't have to change anything. Right, right. So this is a very effective way to expand your Latin knowledge pretty rapidly. Yeah. Going back to the, the word habeo, too, I, I remember when I, back in the day when I, when I taught Latin, I would talk about kind of how habeo is, is, can be a very loose word, just like the English have. Correct. It can mean to possess something in English, right. but it can also be you know, to have something in your mind. Exactly. It has a strong... To understand. Definitely. Right? right? One of the examples I try to use to illustrate that to students is... 
Um, I think it's in the Declaration of Independence. It says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, mm. right? Nobody's actually holding or gripping anything. Exactly. Habayo means to consider. Right. For sure. Yeah. So if I want to say, you know, how are you today? Komodo te habes. Komodo te habes. How are you? Do- how are you doing? How are you doing? te habes. Yeah. Nobody says, how are you holding yourself? Right. What are you talking right. about? Right. No, no, no. And in, in Greek, echo does the same thing. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yep. So to say, you know, you're doing well is eches kalos. You are doing well. You're doing poorly is, uh, um, what would it be? Eches kakos. Yeah. So both the verb, like you said, habeo and echo, they have an extended range of meanings. Right. So, But by uh, using these datives, you're really, you're kind of zeroing down to something much more specific. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, this possessor. Yeah. And play with singulars and plurals. This takes us to our third principle. Okay. Right. Uh, there are 10 verbs in the Greek language that are the, I'm sorry, the Latin language that are the most common, right? These 10 verbs are the most common as drawn from classical authors. Now, this is not my work. I wasn't able to find uh, the actual author of this document that's been floating around the internet, but I've made extensive use of it. It's extremely helpful. Okay. So the first 299 or 300 Latin words based on six authors, Caesar, Cicero, Nepos, Ovid, Sallust, Virgil, right? So those six authors, these are the first 10 verbs, sum, Dico, possum, facio, video, habio, do, wenio, ferro, and wolo. Okay. So the first 10. So s- students often ask me of all ages, Dr. Noe, what textbook do you recommend that I get to learn Latin? And, uh, when can I become fluent? And how long does it take to master it? And I say, well, I'm not fluent. I don't think I have mastery, so I can't really say. But here's what you should do start really simple. Learn these 10 verbs, all their forms, and how to use them. If you could master these, I mean, really deeply master the use of these 10 verbs, you know, three meanings for each and how to manipulate them, Mm -hmm. you can have tremendous success. Yeah. Because they're so common, right? Right. So sum, I am, right? We were talking about est and sunt already. Add in the compounds of sum. Take a little time to learn, right? Ad sum, I'm here. Ab sum, I'm gone. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, de sum, I'm lacking, I'm deficient in some way. That's a tough one. But yeah. In sum, I'm present somewhere, right? So as you're walking around the house and, you know, your child, your wife, your roommate, your husband, whatever, is, uh, where are you, right? Uh, in latrina, in sum. <laughs> I'm in the bathroom. Has <laughs> that right? ever happened to you? Oh, all the time. Yeah. yeah. Where are you now? In culina, in sum, right? I'm in the kitchen. Right. Yeah. Now, some people say, again... How's this going to get me to where I can read Seneca's, you know, De Vita Beata on the happy life? Well, it isn't in one step. Right. But if you just want to know what Seneca says, just read the English translation. Yes. But if you want to appreciate the Latin, make it a project. Be patient. Yes. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, don't, don't think, I'm skipping ahead principle-wise, but don't think of what you're going to be like a year from now. Right, right. Right. Think, what am I going to be like three years from now? Yes. Or even better, five. Or if you're really ambitious, think 10, right? So I was asked recently by a younger man, uh, early 30s, you know, what do I need to do to be fluent in Latin, to master it? So it's a really ambitious, commendable goal. I would ask myself, how much Latin do I want to know when I'm 50? Hmm. Right? 50, you know, the Lord may extend your life till you're 80 or 90. People live a long time. 40 years, that's a long time to enjoy a high level of Latin. Mm-hmm. So so t- give yourself 20 years to get there, right? Yeah. Say, I'm going to learn one or two new Latin words per day. That's 600 per year, right? Mm-hmm. And in 20 years, if my math is correct, that's about what, 12,000 yeah. Latin words? That's an enormous... That's a big vocabulary. That's an enormous vocabulary. Right. You could even forget 10% of it. And you still over you still have over ten thousand words, so not just a kind of a shady, shallow knowledge, yeah, but real mastery, right? But, but you got to commit to going slow, building incrementally. Got to play the long game. Do you, Precisely. Do you remember um, uh, back in back in the uh, Saturday Night Live, uh, Jack Handy's Deep Thoughts? I do very well. This reminds me of one that says where he said, you know, I imagine when somebody, most people go to school to learn how to yodel. They start yodeling right off. It's like, no, <laughs> we build to that. <laughs> yeah. I can't resist a few others. Yeah, okay. Gosh, I like so much. Uh, I think if you are uh, pu- being pulled behind a horse by a cowboy, 
you know, you're being pulled on the you're being pulled on the ground in the dust by a cowboy. Yeah. I think a funny trick would be when he looks back, you're reading a magazine. <laughs> I like that one a lot. That's a good one. That's a good one. Oh, yeah. there's so many good ones. There are so many good ones. Yep. All right. So All right. We, we talked a little bit a little bit about learning compounds. We said both insum and desum and absum. There's also prosum, right? Which means to be out in charge of, right? Mm-hmm. To be in front of, so to have some uh, leadership. There's a whole bunch of them. Now, at this point, would you recommend to your students, uh, because of course all these verbs have various tenses and moods. Yeah. And you, you could very easily get lost in the weeds quickly, uh, right? Nolita vos uh, vexara ipsos. Okay. Don't, don't worry don't about it. Don't worry about it? Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, have very measurable, simple goals, right? This year, I'm going to learn these 10 verbs in, say, the present tense. Okay. If it takes you six months, well, you got six months to spend on the imperfect in the future, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, again, a lot of people, I would say, with all due respect and love and admiration and sympathy for those learning Latin, they have the wrong set of goals, mm. right? What do I need to get through this course and just get done with it? Right. Now, you can learn and teach at the same time. That's what we all do, right? But have very reasonable, measurable, attainable goals. Gotcha. Yeah. That's what you got to do. So we learned, we talked about compounds. Yep. Now, the concept of contextualize which we've also spoken about a little bit, your example of walking around the neighborhood learning some, um, learning some uh, modern Greek. But you contextualize, one can contextualize in a lot of ways. You can take the Daniel Peterson method, you know, put things around. The sticky notes. The, exactly. Mm-hmm. This is a cupboard, right? This is colics. This is the glass on my table, right? Colix est in mensa, or colics in mensa in est, right? It's sitting on top of, maybe not the best example, but... Mm-hmm. But I'm going to make some mistakes. Contextualize, right? Uh, Spend time really thinking about the words and how to put them in a setting. I found that one of my um, roadblocks in trying to learn a a language when my feeble attempts to learn modern Greek or Italian is that when I'm trying to speak to someone or say something, I'm visualizing the words in my head. Yes. So it becomes a script that I'm reading, and that's not helpful to me. Well... I, I, I want to get past that. Well, those are two separate questions, though, right? Is it helpful? Do you want to get past it? Mm-hmm. I think both things are true. I don't really think that I speak Latin, although I know some people that do, right? Like Patrick when he was here. Uh, what I do is compose Latin very rapidly in my head okay. and then read it. <laughs> okay, okay. So I have the same experience, but I don't see any other way to get past that other than continuing to do that. And from what other people tell me, That is their experience as well. And you see, we don't remember what it was like to learn our mother tongue, but I'm quite sure it was very, very similar. Yeah. We thought up something in our head, we stumbled it out in our our mouths, and then we got corrected by others. We made another attempt at it, and eventually we got to some level of fluency. Right. And that reminds me of of another thing that I think is important to, to, to get past is uh, the fear of making mistakes. Mm-hmm. I think that's what stops so many people. They don't want to. They don't want to open their mouths right. unless they know it perfectly. Yes, and you, you you can't do that. Well, this is you know one of the great joys of teaching children instead of adults. Honestly, because the, the, no filter. What right? Yeah, children know that the world doesn't make sense and that they're <laughs> going to make a lot of mistakes. Right, right, right. We adults have reached a point where you know we have a false sense of confidence and a lot of pride. We don't want to look stupid. Yes. Children, they're accustomed to, you know, everybody's always telling them, that's wrong, you did that wrong, doesn't make sense. Yeah. Children are much more capable of just risking things, taking yeah. risks. That's great. Yeah. That's great. So, I mean, you have this experience, right? Uh, I call on a student to read a little bit of Latin or a little bit of Greek. They preface it with, well, Dr. Noe, I can't do this very well. I say, right, I know that. That's why you're in this class. Yeah. If you could already do this, you wouldn't need me and I'd be out of a job. <laughs> exactly. Well, what are you expecting, right? Right, right, right. But it's that's just the strong fear of looking stupid, right? Yeah. So turn that into, uh, you know, a memory uh, opportunity, uh, like we dare stultus non volo, right? Or nolo, we dare stultus nolo. I don't want to appear stupid. I don't want to look stupid. stupid. Or if you're a lady, we dare stulta nolo. I don't want to look more stupid. We dare stultior nolo. Or I don't want to look more stupid than the other guy, right? We dare stultior alio nolo, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, am I speaking Latin? No, I'm I'm composing and maybe even making some mistakes. But 
That's what you got to do. You just, right. just got to practice. Right, right, right. So if you write emails, you know, you can discipline yourself by including at least a few Latin words in your emails. Yep. You can try with the greeting, you know, salve, so-and-so, with the valediction, wale. Then you can get more sophisticated, cura ut valeas, hope you're well. Next time, throw in an adverb. So start very modestly. Build a little bit at a time and only as you have confidence. And listener, um, as someone who receives lots of emails from David, I can <laughs> confirm that he does this a lot. Yeah, I yeah. do. And uh, annoying a little no, bit? No, <laughs> not at all. Not at all. You got you to gotta choose your recipients wisely. Sure. Uh, and of course, it can look really ostentatious, right? And maybe sometimes it is, but the purpose is just practice. Practice. Right? The guy who can throw a football 50 yards or something, you know, he looks like he's showing off to everybody else. But he had to work really hard to be able to do that. And so um, I'm not saying that's analogous, but you get the point. Yeah, so. of course. Um, all right. So what else we got? Um, well, let's go down to number nine. Okay. If we could. Sure. And that is parts of speech. Mm-hmm. Now here, this is going to get a little bit grammatical, but, you know, you, you can't just spend all your time with the, um, you know, the dative of possessor. You got to get grammatical a little bit. So one thing that has really helped me is memorizing the parts of speech, right? There just happen to be eight in English. There are eight in Latin. Mm -hmm. There are eight in Greek. Hmm. English and Latin share the same number, same exact set. Greek is a little bit different. Okay. Uh, But you learn them. Now, how are you going to learn something like that? Ordina alphabetico, alphabetical order. Okay. Oftentimes when people approach the task of memorization, they have no system whatsoever. If you learn it in a certain way and the alphabetical order is the best way, it's so much easier to remember it because you know what to expect. So the first one is adjectivus, an adjective. Then put some examples with that, right? Well, what are some adjectives? Qui sunt adjectivi. Adjectivi sunt bonus. It's good. Et contrarium uh, malus. It's bad. Uh, magnus. Et contrarium parvus. It's small, right? Altus. Et contrarium humilis. Tall and short, right? Yeah. Uh, this is where actual uh, what the late Reginald Foster called uh, Father Reginald Foster called bun work. Bun work. <laughs> bun work. What does that mean? You gotta sit in the seat and do the work. Oh, I got gotcha, you. Got gotcha. you. You gotta sit on your buns and let your I don't know whatever the phrase would be, but you gotta write th- write some things down. Right. 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 And and then practice them. So come up with these lists of opposites and then lists of synonyms. Right. Um, that's you're you're actually spending very little time with English. Mm-hmm. But you're slowly growing a Latin vocabulary. So then you go to on to adverbium. That's the second one. Adjectivus adverbium. Well, quae sunt adverbia. Hmm. Well, there is greatly, magnopere, and there's, you know, poorly, there's male, and there's bene, there's well. Where are you going to find all these words? Well, all over the internet and any good dictionary. Mm-hmm. Just start putting them down and put them into... Uh, you know, sentences with the verbs that we learned in the previous part, the 10 verbs, right? Yeah. I speak slowly. Dico was one of those verbs, one of the top 10. Lente dico. You speak slowly. Lente dicus. She speaks slowly. Lente dicit. So yeah. on and so forth. Now, this is the um, the approach that your favorite text, the, the Per se Illustrata, uh, does a similar kind of yes, thing? Yes, but much better because there's a connected narrative. Right. There's more variety. But the, the part you're saying where the Latin words are defined by and explained by other Latin words is precisely so. Yeah. And think about how you grow an English vocabulary, right? Uh, my daughter is taking a writing class, right? So she's using a thesaurus, mm-hmm. right? How do you grow an English vocabulary? It's not by looking in a Spanish dictionary, right? It's mm-hmm. by looking in an English book, yes. right? Yeah. How are you going to grow a Latin vocabulary? You find synonyms. Right, right, right. It, it's, it just seems so... Obvious, yeah, right, yeah. I'm not saying it's easy, but remember, you adopted the 20 year. Uh, it's a 20 year plan. You agreed to it. Yes, exactly. You, 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 adop- s- you signed up. You signed up now, right? <laughs> well, that doesn't mean that you know years one through 19, you don't know any Latin, and suddenly in your 20, you know it, you know it all. Mm-hmm. But this is going to take time, right. right? And if it's not worth doing, that's fine. But I would not set out with the intention of doing it poorly, right? which some of these rush methods are all that's going to happen. Exactly. you got to stop thinking in terms of 14-week semesters. Correct. Yes, absolutely. And yeah. treat it like a language. Mm-hmm. So you got the adverbium, you get some examples, conjunctio, everybody knows et, hey, it's right there, Yeah. right? Et, atque, ac, 
the enclitic qua, and then we can play this qua game, which I like to play a lot. Well, how do you play the qua game? Well, the qua is an enclitic. You know, it attaches to the end of a word, yeah. just like the Greek ta, and they are cognates. Mm -hmm. um, this is really hard for English speakers. If I want to say Jeff and Dave, right? Well, I can say Jeff et Dave, but Latin can also say Jeff Dave qua. Mm -hmm. You know, by putting the enclitic on the second noun. Yeah. But this is really hard, uh, difficult construction for English users to manipulate because they've never done this. Yes. So, I mean, there's no analogy. So I have met people with degrees, advanced degrees in Latin, who don't really understand this. Hmm. And it's a shame. How are you going to correct it? Get yourself a big book of nouns and start putting them together in both ways, right? Mensa et sella, mensa sella que. The wall, pardries, uh, and the floor, pardries et pavimentum. Pardres pavimentumque, a horse and a cow, equus et bos, equus bosque. It so just sounds start dropping quez. Correct. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it sounds so tedious, mm -hmm. but if you do it 200 times once, once, you'll save yourself so much confusion and misunderstanding yeah. later. And it's probably not going to take 200 times, right? That's an exaggeration. Right. But if you're a teacher, this is an invaluable. Uh, Lesson and the, and the kids like it too. You're practicing your scales. Exactly, it's exactly like that. Yep. Which brings up another principle, and that is consistency. Consistency. Okay. So right. what's what's this about? Well, you you can't cram, right? You know, as a musician, much much better than I could ever be, that uh, you know, if you're going to play the piano for the week, right? You don't say, ah, I didn't get to it on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So on Saturday, I'm going to practice three hours. Right. Right. If you're a concert pianist. You're probably practicing three to five hours every day. Right. But that's a different question. It is much better to practice 15 or 20 minutes of Latin per day or even 10, even if the sum of the six days, you know, say 10 minutes a day, 60 minutes, is less than the 90 minutes you intend to give it on Saturday. Exactly. Why? Well, because fatigue and, and consistency, you just can't sustain concentration, you know, for that long. It becomes very unproductive. Yeah. So, you know, the 20 years that I scoped out, it's not so bad if you start out doing 10 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. So again, people say, Dr. Noe, I'm going to learn Latin. Do you think an hour a day is enough? I usually say, no, that's too much. <laughs> it's way too <laughs> way much. Way too much, right. Why don't you adopt a reasonable goal and say, I'm going to study at breakneck speed for 13 minutes, right? Yeah. And then the next day, I'm going to do the same thing. Get back to me six months from now. Right? Yeah. And then tell me where you are. Now, I was a poor music student. I hated it. Uh, I just, you know, I had the little egg timer for playing the piano. 60 minutes of tick, 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 you know. Yeah. Excruciating. Yeah, I was poor at it. But I know now this is the way to learn a language. It's it's like learning a, uh, a musical instrument. So, like, like 20 years ago when there was the ads for the guy um, schlepping the... Uh, uh, the nine minute abs. Right. Uh, you said he's, he's got it. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, the way to do it. <laughs> well, I can, I can work out for nine minutes. It's everything I eat afterward that, <laughs> yeah, that, you know, undoes that. <laughs> right, so, right, right, right. Yeah. I'd have been on that for sure. <laughs> yep. Uh, so we've covered uh, parts of speech a little bit. We can throw in maybe just one more. That's fun. There are eight all together. Right. And, and, uh, Alphabetical order, mm -hmm. adjectivus ad verbium inter, uh, conjunctio interjectio. That's a fun one. Nomen prepositio pronomen verbum. You got that down, go the other way, right? Ah, reverse. Yes. Right? A verbum pronomen prepositio nomen conjunctio interjectio ad verbium adjectivus. Nice. I had to stop and think a minute, but right. but I've done my scales, see, so I, it's there. I can tell that you, you right. have that rhythm. Correct. Yep. So the interjectio, the interjection. Oh, this is fun, right? These are the bad words, right? Uh, foo is a Latin interjection. Foo, yeah. right? Uh, Oedipal, by Pollux, may Hercule, Hercules save me, yes. right? There's uh, Popeye and house. Yeah, these are fun words. The Romans were people that spoke a language, you yeah. know? And uh, these these occur all over the place. That's great. So, yeah, you could even add music to the to these, you right? You could. Right? Do you remember the old um, schoolhouse rock, you know? Conjunction, junction. I do. What's your yeah. function? <laughs> I do. Yeah. I like the Simpsons spoofs of those a little bit. Oh, I haven't but, seen those. Yeah, you'll have to look them up. Yeah. But that's good stuff. Yep. Uh, and a couple other points. We're running out of time here rapidly, um, but maybe we can return to this this topic in a, a future episode. 
Uh, again, I like to quote uh, Father Reginald Foster, Latin does not have enough forms. Hmm. Now, I'm drawn to anything that is contrarian. You know that. Yes. Right? But conventional wisdom on so many things is mistaken. And here as well. What do people typically think about Latin? Oh, there's so many forms, I can't master them. Right. Actually, it has too few forms. Because in some instances, like the second declension, concilium, a plan, right? Bonum concilium est. That's a good plan, right? The date of an ablative singular, as well as the date of an ablative plural, are identical. Right. You can't distinguish yes, them. Exactly. You have to rely upon context. So if the lack of forms in English can be problematic, uh, the, you know, the relative paucity of forms in Latin is also problematic. Hmm. Now, you might think, oh, that's just perverse. You know, I'm trying to learn an inflected language where the words have endings, and you're telling me there are too few forms? Right. Well, okay, I confess there's a little perversity to it, but what you want to do is retrain your expectations. And your expectations is that it would look like English, right? Right. And those expectations are wrong. So retrain them to say that I love case endings because they tell me with so much specificity what each word is doing in the sentence. Yes. Right? So the horse eats the apple. Equus malum comedit, right? Or consumit. Right. I can turn those words around. Malum equus consumit. It means the same thing. Or consumit malum equus. Doesn't matter what the order of the words is mm -hmm. because the words have endings. Yes. Can't do that in English. So far from being a handicap of the language, the endings are its strength. Yes. And we would like to have more of them, but some forms are ambiguous. Gotcha. Right. So yeah. it's about retraining expectations. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Well said. Uh, how are we doing on time? Do we got time? Oh, for... we're way over. We're way over? <laughs> we're way over. Okay. So do we got to we gotta wrap this up? We got to wrap it up. Okay. Yeah. We didn't get to Mike Fontaine. I wanted to read some interesting stuff from his uh, How to Hack Your Latin. I wanted to talk about uh, this book, The Devil Knows Latin, and um, Ab Urba Condita, something I learned from uh, Terence Tunberg. But... Well, this is a deep well. I think we we can return to this okay. uh, down the line. Yeah. So, what have we uh, what have we learned today, Doctor Winkle? What have we given the audience? Would you say? I would say we've given them uh, some really solid building blocks where they can start their twenty plus year journey of becoming <laughs> right. a Latin guru. And they're going to need this book, yes. right? Or they're going to want this book, the first, I suppose. Uh, the uh, the Usborn first thousand words in Latin. Yes, I wish I had some stock, you know, uh, for selling this book, but it's great. Beautiful illustrations. So, and you get to hunt on every page for, is it the golden duck? No, it's not a golden duck. It's a little duck. It's a little You're duck. You're thinking of gold bug. Right. So, but the, Richard Scarry. This is a non-golden duck. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> right. uh, in the back, there are indices, right? Colors, numbers. You got to add colors to your stuff because color helps you remember things so much. It's very true. We got to come back to this topic. I yep. can see that. But we got to get out of here, don't we? We do. So we got, uh, as always, people to thank. Mm -hmm. Thanks to Mishka, yep. uh, Fernando, our great engineer. She's been working so hard. Uh, you know, not only does she help with ad nauseum, but she helps with my Moss method and Latin per diem stuff. And I've been just throwing so much stuff at her, and she's really talented. You've been trying to trip her up. You can't do it. <laughs> no, actually, yeah, if you go watch those uh, those Moss method office hours... You know, she's putting the Greek and Latin together very nicely. That's excellent. I'm so grateful. We got to thank uh, Ken Tamplin. Yes. For the commercial bumper music. Yes. And uh, the composition of the intro music, which is played by... Scott Vinzen. Yeah, boy, that guy can rip on the guitar. Blazing guitar. He's been doing his scales, right? Oh, you, uh, you talked... We get Scott on the show. He would tell you how exactly. important the scales are. Right? Yeah, I just heard him say recently, you know, you know, I've been playing guitar professionally for 30 years, he, he said, and uh, I still practice an hour and a half a day. Amazing. Right? That's commitment. He doesn't need to practice, you might say. Right, but. right. But not right. true. Yep. And if you want to get in touch with us, uh, tell us what you like, what you don't like. Give us some ideas for uh, an upcoming show. If you want a shout out, yes. drop us a note. You can write to Dave at Dave at AdNauseum.com. Don't forget the V. Or to me at Jeff at AdNauseum.com. Again, don't forget the V. And that's right. And Jeff, yes. what do we have on tap for next week, episode 65? What are we bringing the listeners? It's going to be an archaeological mystery. Is what it's oh. going to be. We're going to talk about... Uh, the Lost Tomb of Alexander the Great. Alexander Illamagnus, UBS. Yes. Where is he? Where is he? It's one of the great unsolved mysteries of archaeology, it's a, yep. and it's a great story. Mm. Yep. I, I look forward to it with uh, quite a bit of anticipation. Excellent. So leave a review, I guess. We covered all that. Um, yeah, we got all, all that. All um, right, all right. Yeah, uh, or, yeah, but I mean, leave a review on your favorite platform. That's yeah. another thing. You know, give us a, a nice... 
five star review if you if you so desire. <laughs> We'd like that. Yes. All right. So before we say "Walete omnes," mm-hmm. say goodbye to everyone. Jeff gets to give the gustatory parting shot. Yes, this comes from Delia Owen's uh, "Cry of the Kalahari," right? Uh, in which she says, "For a scavenger." Patience is the key to the pantry. I like that. Yes, and so true. Yeah, thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you.